Good morning. Okay. Uh, I'm Rajesh Nair. I, I, as, uh, I work here and in Kuala Lumpur. You know, Asia School of Business is a new business school that is slow and starting in Kuala Lumpur. So I'm, it's brand new. Our ba first batch of students just joined this week. So I'm already late. I have to be there next week. <laughs> okay. uh, and I head the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, which is brand new from scratch, from the ground up. Uh, my work, my thesis here was on how do you create uh, entrepreneurs from ground up? So my work was on can you change the mindset of students, youngsters, uh, to take on entrepreneurship? And uh, for that, I had to go back to my own life to figure out uh, how my mind changed. I, so uh, I, I was born in a small little village in, in India, you know, uh, lower middle class. Uh, growing up in, you know, with uh, never been exposed to too many technologies, and all the my my favorite guy was a radio repair guy in my village. So I used to go hang out with him to see how he fixes radios, and you know, and uh, in high school and college I started designing audio systems, and you know, and then went on from there on. Uh, I'm basically a physicist and uh, electrical engineer, uh, and I wanted to be a product designer. So I did my uh, master's in product design, in electronic product design. And then I realized you can only design products if it's manufacturable. So I came for another step of graduate, grad school in manufacturing engineering in mechanical uh, at UMass. Uh, this was 28 years back. And uh, then uh, from there I started working for a few years and designed hundreds of products. I was involved in, my, you know, uh, uh, in all the MacBook Air, uh, iPad and, and such thermal management of all those kind, kind of things. But what really hit me were a few things. So I just want to make sure that the, my, my uh, slide show shows up here. Oh, it doesn't. OK, that's OK. So don't worry. So a so, uh, few things happen. I, you know, I, I, why I'm saying this, this is a, a, exactly what I'm going to apply to when I talk about the rest of the, f uh, uh, f uh, when I go through the rest of the uh, uh, session, you'll understand why it is important. Uh, designed a few products, and then you realize I wanted to be, you know, I was work working with my boss. He was going around. He was a startup guy, and you realize you can you can do the same thing. You know, you realize that you know you start gaining certain confidence. Uh, then the f my first baby was born, and. Of course, they don't come with any user manual. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, as you can see, I'm never into sports. You know, so you know, <laughs> so this is not the, the fittest guy in town. Uh, so when this little baby f was born, I f we didn't, uh, you know, my wife was supposed to take care of feeding, and I was supposed to take care of the rest. Okay, obviously, and uh, she used to get diaper rash at home uh, at night. You know, f during she was a little baby. And of course, my wife used to give me hell. I say, you're not changing diapers on time. You're being lazy. And you know, I am doing these things, but I have no idea if it is effective. Uh, so if lying down and thinking about it, I said, one is a deterministic system. Other one is a variable system. I can change when I want. But when she pieces, I have no idea when she does. Okay. And there's a time period between this that matters. Okay. So I, next day, I took two uh, you know, safety pins, connected to her diaper, connected to wires, and put an <laughs> electronic circuit, uh, which would uh, did look for resistance between the two pins and start playing twinkle, twinkle, little stuff. So there's a little speaker hanging off of it and uh, off of her crib. You know, and she's about a couple of weeks old. And, you know, and you know, I'm sure DSI or whatever, you know, they would have Kill me, you know, for uh, in Department of Social <laughs> Welfare or whatever. <laughs> okay, and uh, now I know I have connected these two things: the moment when she pees and when I can change. Okay, <laughs> so uh, you know that saw problem was solved. But the only thing is now this baby started crawling, and I can't have all these, you know, s you know, spaghetti or wires with her. So changed it into a little plug-in thing, and had data for six months or so of her peeing and pooping pattern, you know? And <laughs> typed it all into, uh, and s do, did a, a recursive analysis to see if there's a pattern, and 
Finally, long story short, I got the US patent for you know, dapper wetness detection and you know, toilet training, and you know, I thought I had absolutely the best product in town. So I put about $50,000, $70,000 of my own to uh, make the injection molding plastic, in the injection molded plastic and all those kind of things, made the product, started going around, um, started a company, just me, okay. Uh, trying to sell this thing, and it absolutely flopped. I know every single dime I put into it was, was, was lost. Okay, so I used to go f in the f in New Hampshire mall, you know, trying to sell this, at least get some feedback, and uh, tried that for about six months, seven months, and I, I, my, ran, my money ran out, and I went back to my regular job. <laughs> uh, that was the biggest failure as a startup guy, but that was absolutely the best experience and learning that I had as, a, as an entrepreneur. I had to fail during my first attempt. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done you know, the next one. Because when we think about it as a failure, from my point of view, I figured out 80% of the things that actually how to do 80% of the stuff. 20% of the things I knew exactly what went wrong. And what went wrong was I was trying to tell moms uh, how to take care of your baby when moms felt that I was trying to introduce a gadget between them and the kid. I should have sold it to dads. That, that, that thing came up. You know, 10 years later, somebody told me, why didn't you sell it to dad? Because you created it for dad. <laughs> why did I think of that? <laughs> you know, I talked about diaper rash and doctor visits and how much it costs and the pain. And moms felt that I am somehow thinking, I am trying to say that they don't understand the baby. You know, a, a de device to short circuit that. And that, I, and I, I was foolish enough not to understand it for 10 years, that too, okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, second startup, I was a little smarter because I I went with someone who already was experienced. I kind of figured out some more. And the third startup is now 20 years old. It's, I think in, in December it will be 20 years. Uh, dealing with thermal management, heat, you know, industrial stuff. Missile, missile launchers and CT scanners and computers and, and all this kind of stuff. So that's why I was, uh, I was involved in all these things. So when I took on this challenge as my thesis, this, this thing as my thesis, I got fellowship to go to India, for this is from Mr. Ratan Tata, uh, go to India, find an interesting problem and come up with a solution. So I traveled across India and found that there are people who are very, very innovative, bright minds. But what is missing is taking these creations to market. And if you could actually do that, and that is entrepreneurs. If you can somehow bring that, uh, that you can, you can really uh, change the, 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 the dynamics. You can change how many people start up companies, how many, you know, and, uh, and all these kind of things. So question is, why do nations need entrepreneurs? And first thing is that if you look at uh, what happened in uh, uh, you know, the Arab Spring and, and such, it was not because of oppression or anything like that. It's primarily unemployment. Okay, what all those things happen in the Middle East because primarily the primary cause was unemployment. There's quite a lot of people without without jobs. Uh, second thing is wealth. This primarily means you know how do f government needs taxes. You know, wealth doesn't mean for you, it's for the government, okay? So uh, government needs these people to be peaceful and to create wealth for them. And we could actually address both these things through entrepreneurship. If you, uh, Kaufman's study shows that almost, almost all net new jobs in the last 40 years were created by startups. If you really look at, this happened in SNL, for you know, whatever, for, Oh, this is in dot com days. The ex established companies kept dropping jobs, and it was the startups who kept on creating wow. new jobs. Okay, so the the fact that a, a, a nation needs entrepreneurs is you know there's no question about that. So the, the question that I was asking is that instead of trying to create you know five percent more entrepreneurs or you know few things like how do we change 10x, instead of going by you know, a few percentage points, uh, completely one exponential level up. 
And so that became my, my passion for the last you know, few years. Uh, 11, 11 years back, I started a nonprofit in India creating, uh, doing all these innovation competitions and such. Uh, so this has been my work for quite, quite a lot of years. Now, if you look at any of the uh, programs that, uh, for government programs or any of these policies and, you know, for, uh, and such, they're all looking for that one single person, okay, or the, the entrepreneur who says, I want to be an entrepreneur, then yeah, you have all these things to take care of, you know, uh, uh, to, to support them. You know, actually even in universities and such, the entrepreneurship center primarily focuses on someone who says they want to be an entrepreneur. Okay, they don't. But I feel we should be focusing on this. Okay, mm -hmm. I f because you could actually cha change the ratio by about a hundred times. So uh, in the the number of entrepreneurs that you can generate. So that became my 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 uh, target group. So people who have kids who have absolutely no idea or not ever thought of starting up, or they could even be an entrepreneur. That became my my target group, which kind of what you guys are talking about a little earlier. So now the question is, how do you do this? And through my uh, study and 11 years, close to about several thousand kids of you know, working with a thousand, several thousand kids, uh, I found there are three major factors that change their thinking. One is internal, that's their self-confidence, and you know, they call it self-efficacy. Uh, you know, and the kind of things that are brought, that are built through failure and experience, you have to fail. You know, if you have succeeded all your time, either you haven't, you're lying or you have your, uh, you haven't tried outside your zone of comfort. Okay, so you have to fail. So through failure comes a certain confidence, like my first company was talking about. Uh, so internal factor. Second thing is external. That means what kind of ecosystem that you have, supportive ecosystem that you have around. These are all very common. Common, you know, common sense. The last part is how early can you intervene in their life to change? So if you think about, I'll get involved with this person when he's 35 years old to become, make him into an entrepreneur, which is kind of what happened to me. You know, if, uh, I'd, I wish somebody had done something to me when I was 16, 17, wow. you know. And the, you know, because the life path would have been very, very different. At that point, if you change it by one degree, you can actually make a huge uh, difference, you know, 10 years later. So, of course, being from Sloan, I have to do a little bit of uh, system dynamics modeling, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'll tell, I, I promise you there's no, no, this is very, very, again, I just put my whole concept into a, a chart, so it, it makes sense. So you have a whole body of students, especially in universities and, and such, and some of them aspire to be entrepreneurs, but they have no idea what to do. Some of them jump into becoming a student entrepreneur, and then some of them become very experienced, experienced entrepreneurs. So, so there is a, there's a, you know, stock and flow here, okay. I, when I was doing my study in India, I found the rural schools have, you know, 5,000 to one. Actually, my, the school I studied, it was more than about 12,000 to one, but the two people, that, that's because in the last 12 years, they only had one student entrepreneur in the school that I was teaching in, college that I was teaching in. If they had two, it would have come, immediately come down to 6,000. So I can't say that I brought it from 12,000 to 6,000. So I, let me just go with something. This is all approximate, okay. So I, in rural if, uh, India, it was about 5,000 to one. Uh, I believe in, in, if you come to urban uh, towns or uh, towns and cities, it may be about 1,000 or so, okay. In MIT, I think it may be about 100, 100 to one entrepreneur. Okay, so uh, what is the big difference, you know, in, in these places? So f the, the quick analysis was that, so of course there is a flow, and you have little taps that let things flow from one to the other. I, if you consider an ecosystem within the university or the community, uh, ecosystem can actually ch open these taps, okay? And if without that, you don't, Kids don't know how to move from one box to the other, and uh, 
once you have certain student entrepreneurs and you know, f established entrepreneurs, you have investors who can come and change, move the flow a little bit more. At the, you know, at the end of the day, an investor is an entrepreneur who feeds off of other entrepreneurs. You know, I'm sorry to say that. That is pretty much it. Okay? You know, and, the, and they come when there is enough uh, entrepreneurs that they can feed off of. You know. uh, now, of course, you have, when you have uh, entrepreneurs, the, the ecosystem grows. And some, at some point, universities wake up and create a program to create entrepreneurship. And in the last few years, universities have started doing that. Uh, and then, of course, at some point, government wakes up you know, to realize that there is a way to create these things. And then, they, of course, they put money down. And I can promise you close to about 80 90% of the money go waste in most of these countries. Uh, if you look, uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Boulevard of Bro Broken Dreams, which kind of talks about Boulevard of Broken Dreams. It, it talk, uh, talks about uh, startup uh, you know, uh, kind of programs different governments started in different countries and how they failed. Okay? Because they all are betting on that one little fish that is trying to jump. Okay, and where they're not focusing on the other side, they're not. I call it prequel. You know, forget all the work that is happening around here are all on kids who say they want to be an entrepreneur. I don't care about it anymore because there are enough programs to take care of them. So my focus is exactly how do I push enough kids out of there so that the existing systems can take care of. You know, and if you really look at professional sports. They don't, uh, I don't play sports, I told you. you know, so I have, if, you know, for, for, for the Red Sox is not going to take someone who walks off the s street and say, I want to play in your team. They actually go down to kids in schools and, you know, they have process in minor leagues and things like that before they actually take someone now. We don't do that in your entrepreneurship. Okay, we pick kids who say, I want to be an entrepreneur and how well they can present. They put money down. First companies go 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 under, and you know investors complain about it, and you know. And most worst thing that can happen is that they brand this kid as, you know, you're not an entrepreneur. You can't. Why don't you just find a regular job? Okay. It's like asking a baby who just fell, taking first step to say walking is not for you. Okay. So. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and we have we are not training these kids to you know to get through multiple uh, phases. I believe they have to fail. And you don't take a baby on a stairs and say, learn walking now. You know, if you take them to a flat surface, safe surface, so you can actually fail. And you know, your cost of failure is low. You, know, you don't put them in a very dangerous uh, position. And our entrepreneurs go through that. They, they put tons of money on them, all kinds of expectation, and they cannot deliver. And and uh, you know th that's the kind of you are actually almost forcing certain fail level of fa failure on that. Okay, so all this flow depends on can can we bring the the masses moving from left to right? Mm -hmm. All these things happen with that. So if the bottleneck is somewhere here. If you go to a small, I, I'm, when I say community school, high school, college, university, just about anywhere, can we start moving people from? this box to the next box. And once this the m movement starts, then the rest of it all start up. And this is where <coughs> you need to have some kind of a early innovation entrepreneurship program. And you know, a, a maker lab is so critical to that. OK. Uh, so asking someone to be an entrepreneur is like uh, it's a tall wall to climb. There's so much to do before you can be an entrepreneur. But we expect them to just be an entrepreneur on the second day. So my process was, can we take them through steps? Steps where they gain confidence, gain experience, and slowly be, start feeling that they can do that, instead of one day saying, OK, you're an entrepreneur. You know, here's a million dollars. So the, of course, that doesn't happen. But uh, so I, I came up with a very simple framework. And the simple framework starts with, first thing is a zero, which is an uninitiated student, which is like if you go to any of these universities, they're looking for uh, graduation and placement. They're looking for, you know, for theory 
they have learned all the theory. You know, I'm a victim of the university system. You know, we all are. You know, because we've we've been taught all the things without ever applying that. You know, so I believe there is data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Okay, data is what you what is. You know, information is what it means, and knowledge is how do you apply it, and wisdom is how do you generalize it and go take it to different places. I think there is no point in teaching information. We should be teaching knowledge. How do you apply things in you know, what, what you see here? But uh, you know, yeah, I go to any of these small universities, they're still, there's the information that they're teaching. You know, and that, that era has already passed. But uh, f an application of what you learn is so critical in, in for the student to f understand the relevance of what they're learning and to build certain confidence that they can actually apply this. So that is the first phase. And the second phase is a maker. Maker is someone you know, where we, you know, we teach digital fabrication. I, I'll come to uh, make, I want them to design, make, and play. That means please don't make things that are going to solve anyone's problem. Make things that are fun, okay? So because you're not, not, let's not be problem solvers yet. Let's just make things that you really want to make, mm -hmm. okay? So for my programs uh, f uh, uh, primarily focus. Uh, I, I've been running this program called Forty Eight Hour Maker Fest. In, it started in Kuala Lumpur. Now I ran it in you know, Vietnam and U.S. and all all over the place. So this primarily focuses on: Can you teach kids? you know, basics of ideation and design thinking. Can you teach them to do physical design? Like they learn CAD, they learn basics of electronics, they learn basics of uh, coding, and create a product in 48 hours from scratch. Okay, so, I'll, so the tools they have to master are, you know, as I said, ideation, presentation, big deal. I, I believe, primary factor in confidence is, this, is the ability to stand up and talk, okay? And that can be taught in, in, in about a few hours because these, we never actually ask these kids to stand up and do that. First time they're like, I've had kids stand up and shiver, okay? And, you know, shaking, you know, in front of the, uh, with their own classmates because they had never, sp you know, spoken in front of others. And then by end of this thing, they're just standing up and presenting to, to the public. Okay, so we'll come to that. Mm -hmm. How do you look at something as a, as a system? How do you basically, I use of Arduino as my kit, you know, so, so electronic coding and, and such. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, this is all I teach. I teach this 10 lines of, eight lines of code. Wow. Okay, I say, okay, there is a big loop and a small loop and the big loop is one and small loop is this. Okay, I said this is the blinking, this just blinks an LED. I said change the speed of blinking and then you go change it. I said now go to Google and here's a servo motor and here's an LED or here's a switch. Make me this. And then they have to go find this. And he said, no, I can't do it. I said, you can. And about an hour later, you know the servo motor is doing things and the sensor is working. I do not teach. I just mentor. Because I, if I were the a teacher, then my limit knowledge would be the limitation, you know. So I don't know much. Okay, so I just get them to get them to do things. Then teach them CAD. This is the simplest CAD that you can download for free, SketchUp. And I teach them three tools: draw shape, pull push, and do a f uh, f you know offset line. So with that, kids start designing things. And I kid you not. In about an hour, they start designing these things and we 3D print them. And when, when they take something that they thought and you know, hold it in their hand, that changes their thinking. That changes their confidence. And that is pretty much what you're trying to get to. So how do you change their confidence? And then, of course, we go into fabrication. We actually make these things and make it all work. When these 48 hours, they start on a Friday afternoon and end on a Sunday afternoon. And kids just stay up till 5 in the morning. Okay, you know, I, so we, this was run at, at KLCC Tower. There's a museum inside by Petronas Museum. And 
they gave them all sleeping bags and I was there for two nights. These kids were just working all night. You know, if you if school asked them to do a homework overnight, you know, they would have find 15 different reasons not to do it. You know, all I'm giving them is I'm not even giving them a, a homework. I just introduce them to certain things and then they run with it. It is it's it's you know it's it's not about teaching, it's about how do you bring out what they already have inside. So this make a fest, I'll just show you one example. This was conducted for 17 year olds, just high school graduates. They have something called a, a foundation year, which is like a pre university. And hopefully, the. That's Professor Fine, Charlie Fine, who is the president of ASB. Yeah. So these kids, once they go through this, you know, you have turned on certain switches in their heads. Okay. And it, it's not the same anymore after that. Okay. It's not the, they're looking for, you know, for how do I use this? What is the meaning of what I'm learning? You know, uh, so. <coughs> <coughs> Have you heard of a useless box? Useless box is just a box that when you turn a switch switch on, it'll turn itself off. Okay, that's it. These are again done by, for, you know, and then then of course it can get angry and you know so, but it, it is like a fun toy. But think about the mind of the designer. Okay, think about it from the other side. <laughs> so. Again, these are all 17-year-olds. In, 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 this is in Penang. Uh, I have several, several videos, you know, but I've, you can't. Uh, <laughs> so you know, if you really look at the product, there is a, a very interesting about four or five parts to it. One is, how do I interact with the product? If I'm designing this, I need to understand how a user interface works. From there comes, you know, how do I create a mechanical design, electrical design, and the software that actually makes the behavior happen, and all these kind of things. Okay, so uh, so it is even though at the end of the day it is looking like a, just a box with all those tons of work that uh, the hammer was 3D printed, and you know they just learned the whole Arduino coding and you know and all those kind of stuff from scratch. Okay, so then I took this. I said, can only engineers do this? So I did the same thing in art. School and I went to the eastern end of Borneo Island at, at the Sabah, uh, state of Sabah in, in, in Malaysia, and I taught uh, diploma students in art, painting. I'm talking about you now, and they say they did exactly the same thing. You know, no exposure to CAD or coding or anything like that. Okay, then I uh, this is for sixth through eleventh graders, and this I ran in in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. Uh, same question, can they learn, 6th through 11th graders figure out these things. 
So you'll see them. Uh, and these, these things are CADed, laser cut. Uh, they created a robot that when you put a ball, it detects a ball, kicks it, and a goal post that senses the goal and scores a goal. OK. Again, 48 hours. OK. So Okay, so same thing. These kids are actually, you know, parents came and left them, and you know, next day evening they came on a, fri a Friday evening they came to pick up. They said, no, we'll stay, stay, stay back. And parents left, and the Sunday they came back with, you know, Saturday they came back with clothes and all those things, you know, and they just, just stayed there, and worked on things. You know, this one huge element that is missing in most schools is teamwork. You know, they have to learn how to work in teams. And uh, I, you know, since I've done several of these things, I've worked with close to about a few several hundred teams, and I can smell when the team is going to go have problems. <laughs> <laughs> and when I see a type A ty someone, guy, it normally is a guy, <coughs> who'd say, I have the best idea, and forces the whole team to agree with him, and after initially they'll be polite, then they'll say, "Okay, do whatever for you want." Okay, like you know, and you can see the team could fail, you know. And then you have teams who have absolutely no idea. Each one is trying different things, and then they start coming and talking about it. And no one has any ego issues, and you know they're all equally, for, you know, uh, confused. I find them coming back with something really great. Okay, so and I have different ways of dealing with all of them. So. That was the whole maker experience. And maker experience, as I said, primarily was about you know, design, make, and play. Nothing to do with anything else. So I gi used to give them uh, topics like, uh, create a toy for your pet, or uh, make a mechanical design with intelligence. And that, that's useless box was that. You know, they they, they uh, interpreted that as that. Uh, you know, make something for your kitchen, or so, things like that. And they go. Make these things, OK, to, uh, to the theme. So what is the innovator? Innovator goes to the next stage. He needs to solve a problem. The first one, you're not supposed to solve a problem. You're just supposed to learn and make, you know, that's all. Next thing is to, you need to learn, uh, solve a problem. I just I teach them design thinking, uh, teach them the whole process of approaching a problem and such. In this case, primarily empathy, you know. and. Empathy, need, and solution are the three things that, when, if I say, they need to understand the, the, the situation, the customer situation, or well, the problem situation really well. And uh, don't come back, you know, if people who, I, who come back with things like, you know, Twitter for cats and things like that have no idea what empathy means, okay? Like, you know, you, I, when they're all driven by technology rather than uh, from the other side. So you need to understand develop the empathy, define the need, and then come back with a solution. So I run this one week long maker to innovator boot camps. The other one was just two days, 48 hours, two and a half, whatever. Uh, this is one week long, where they go through this whole process of uh, 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 mastering empathy, need definition, you know, going all the way to fabrication and validation. So again, don't worry about the business side of things. All you need to do is, can you understand a problem, get deep into the problem situation, and create a solution and test it out to see if it works. So uh, I take them to places where normally they're not, you know, they don't visit. This is, uh, this is the two weeks back. I was in India, I ran, ran a one week long course. They took them to rubber plantation to study how people work in the rubber plantation uh, to, this is somewhere else in cattle farm. They have to go work in the cattle farm. So they have to you know, scoop poop and do, do all kinds of things. Only then you will actually understand what it takes to solve a problem for them. You, know? you can't just stand up in, you know, in your suit and say, OK, I, I can solve your problem. No, you need to get deep into it. Uh, this is all MIT students. I took them to 
in, in, this is in, in India, it took them to uh, uh, a place where they make ropes. This is all in villages. This is interesting. I took a, last year I ran a program for TCS, which is a large uh, uh, software company in India, Tata Consultancy, you know, and uh, Tata Services or whatever. Uh, I ran a program for the CXO level, you know, for, uh, the, one, two of them were CXOs and the, uh, the HR team. So this was a multi-day program, and on the second last day, I said, we are going to take you to the, to the red light district in Mumbai. So here's the global VP of HR and you know directors and all of them. And we went into the streets meeting and talking to prostitutes and you know understanding the problem. You know, you till then of course I had no idea what I, this is walking into this this whole environment for the first time. Initially they didn't trust us because they thought we were from the police. You know and uh, nobody would talk to us. And once we started making the connection and started talking to them, you know, it is, you know, almost, we were almost crying with the situation that these people are in. You know, most of them came from different villages in India. They were brought to bring, you know, saying, you know, we'll, we'll find you jobs. And before they knew, they became, became prostitutes, you know, and then now we can't get out of this uh, cycle. If you really look at all this uh, sex slaves issue and in, in the US and anywhere else, you know, Story is no different, okay? And we, and this guy, he was, and he actually went and talked to them. After the program was over, he went and started a program to help them. So for the last one year, he had been, you know, it really hit him because when we came back and started discussing, people were crying. Like, they were really, really, and that is empathy. Empathy, you know, it's not, it's not like, it's not sympathy about, oh, I feel sorry for you. It is like I know I have, you know I can almost put myself in your shoe and, and feel that, and that drives the the you know the commitment to solve a, this problem. Uh, this is in uh, uh, palm uh, f uh, f uh, plantation in Malaysia. I took these kids. I, t I ran a program for in, uh, for kids in India, and I took them to uh, a school for kids with cerebral palsy. Okay, so initially we were hanging around taking pictures, and one of the kids took my iPhone, and she figured out how to do this, and she's and she started taking pictures, and you know, and this is the picture she took of me with the other kids in the in the so, and I, I think I'll be showing a video later. This is in the uh, we went and stayed in a tribal village. We st I was staying in a hut with a family of four husband, wife, and two kids. You know, the whole hut was about one single room, which was about 10 feet by 10 feet. And I was lying in a corner, of, you know, thatched hut in the middle of the, the uh, 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 tribal area. And I, next day, I went to teach. I went to the, the elementary school. And the elementary school had two rooms, about 15 students. Uh, one teacher didn't show up. So we decided to teach. OK. And this is this is the whole whole class, okay? And they, they, as you can notice, there are no desks and chairs; they all sit on the floor. And uh, the funny thing is that that uh, alphabet chart that you see there, most of them don't make don't make any sense to these kids, okay? They have xylophone, you know, X for xylophone. I said, what the hell is a xylophone, okay? Like you know, <laughs> you know, and you know, zebra. I have no idea if any of these kids have ever seen a zebra in their life, you know, <laughs> and you know, but. There, is, there are educational things which have absolutely no relevance to these kids. And I asked them to write alphabets, made them write alphabets. Most of them could not write most of the alphabets. But they were in third, fourth grade. Okay? And they had projectors and computers that the government gave in cages where there's no power. Okay, so finally, it is only the blackboard that works. Okay, so. And we also took them to people, kids to industry. This is an in injection molding uh, factory. Again, it, taking them to the industry or the factory is not as much fun because you're solving a technical problem or you're solving an operational problem. I really like to take them to places where it hits you in your chest. Mm -hmm. okay, and that changes their thinking. And that is when you really want to go do something. You know, I've. Maybe take them to 
even in the US, there are a lot of places that we can actually do the same thing. You know. So when I talk about need, I primarily am talk about, talking about an unmet human need. Okay, uh, not a technical need, you know, and, and then if you really look at a need, you can actually find multiple strategies to solve this. And each strategy, you could have multiple products, ways to solve it, and each product could be achieved through multiple technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens is that if you start from one end, you have all the options open. You can pick the best option, okay? And, and that is called design thinking you almost have to understand the need really well and then start thinking. And you know, if not, the other one is called uh, the curse of the engineer. And people from MIT can <laughs> totally understand this. Okay. <laughs> I have this technology. Let me force fit it into solving your problem. And you come all the way back to the need, and you look back, and you realize there are so many easier ways to solve this exactly the same problem. But I started with my technology. That's the problem. This is the curse of the engineer. And I, when I work with them, I can almost see them thinking, I have this Bluetooth-based something, is it? and then try to solve somebody's problem without, you know. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of this thing called, uh, there was a, uh, a campaign in India, uh, in Mumbai. Uh, have you heard of the Dabawalas of Mumbai? So close to, I think, about 4 million lunch boxes yeah. are uh, you know, go from home to offices and back home from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, by these people who carry the lunch boxes. It's a, a Harvard study. Yes, okay, there's Six Sigma f and all that. Okay, uh, so the food goes back and forth. They, you know, all I need to do is, as a housewife, you know, you make the food at 10 o'clock. Somebody comes and picks it up, and they don't have any addresses. All they have are little color dots. And they take it somewhere else, somebody else picks up those color dots and somewhere else, and for by 2 o'clock it comes back to your house. So, and also there are about 300,000 kids in, in Mumbai who go hungry. Okay, so now they talk, talked about how do we solve this problem of hunger, and the, the way they solved it is with a sticker. So when, if I want my food to be shared, whatever is left over, I'll just put a sticker on my box, and at some point it gets taken out and it, it is given to kids, and leftover food, and the box go back home. Go, uh, box goes back home. There is no technology. If I had asked an MIT engineer, he would have come up with all kinds of, you know, I can think of RFID and you know, you know, everyone having a scanner and just well, a, a million ways to do these kind of things. But how do you solve this problem with absolutely you know, minimum amount of technology? And that is. Uh, what I kind of drive them to. If you really look at this, is a, f a very interesting study, 110, 101 call, uh, startups that failed. They asked them, give me the three major reasons why you failed. And uh, the 40% of them said, we found that there was no market need. <laughs> so they, 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 they went out and put a team together, developed the product, you know, found funding, and went out and try to sell, and you realize that nobody wanted it. OK. So at what point, this is one of those engineeritis issues. OK. So what I push my kids to do is to fail. So I s tell them that I want you guys to fail. I actually want you guys to fail several, several times. Because only after you have failed enough times, you would actually have, first thing, the guts to face failure. Second is to come up with something really creative. You know, if, we, if, if you look at, I, when I saw, when I read business plans, I said, if I can think about it, you know, a million other people can think about it. There's no edge to this. You're not coming up with anything that is, you're coming up with very, very safe ideas, okay? Because we always try to think within our zone of com competence, you know? Because I put my bar at one foot, and I can jump over it over and over, and I can feel that I'm really good. You know, but I haven't stepped out of my zone of competence. Of course, if I'm trying to do brain surgery, I'm going to kill a lot of people, which is well outside my, my zone of comfort. Okay. I believe you should be failing about 50% of the time. Each time you try, only then you're actually working on the edges. And how do you tell these kids, when you first time you give them a problem, they come back with very safe ideas. And I'll let it get out of 
out of their system. Okay, fine. Okay, that's all good. Now you have said all these things. Now go find something uh, that is completely outside of all the things that you tell uh, you, know, you said till now. And that's when that's the only way you can actually expand your zone of competence. So this is uh, failure is like a big deal. Uh, if if you uh, I, we, when I run these programs, I used to have this wall of failure thing, you know. And any team that has maximum number of failure gets more points because they are actually trying things, you know, to fail. That is perfectly fine. So these one-week courses that I run, uh, this is, uh, as I said, I had started this uh, uh, a nonprofit in India called TechTop that runs a competition and one one-week long program. Uh, this is from. La, uh, last year. In 2005, we decided we'd start with something very simple. So, we started a competition for engineering college students. This is the 10th year of our program. This year, we had students from MIT also join it. They had to understand how do you take a problem, break it down, come up with uh, interesting solutions, start thinking outside your zone of comfort, and come up with unusual solutions and connect it back to reality. I'm really excited about being here and working with the community and actually trying to come up with a product that will help people. So this is like the time, it's like a practice for me to do actual stuff in build. We had three tracks. One was on IoT, that is Internet of Things, and second one was on Health and Living. So they created products and solutions for better living. And third one was called Enabling Toys. The mentors are very passionate about what they do. They're very knowledgeable. We took them to places where they were not actually comfortable visiting. The moment we went there and once they broke the ice, they felt very comfortable. Here it's like I'm actually in the field. I actually go out into the world. I went to a couple of hospitals and I saw something and I actually experienced what they actually do in everyday life. Going to places like Kantari and the disabled school and actually seeing the people and the problems actually at hand, it completely changed our outlook on everything. Main point of this whole thing was to, you know, let us feel the problem which they are facing so that we can come up with the technology so that we have a clear problem statement that it will be clear in our mind to, you know, what exactly we want to make for them. And on the final day, they had a demo, they exhibited the products that they had. The primary point that they really gained is the confidence. The confidence that a week before, they did not think that they could do this. And they have gone back to their communities and their colleges where they can actually pass on this energy to. And uh, we want to continue make, doing this uh, workshop in the next couple of months. So uh, last year, this was a program where I, it's a uh, one month long program where I took MIT students for the first week of innovation workshop and I'll show a little bit of on the other program. And things like this come up. You know, define a problem. Can you create the solution? Okay. And you have to get all your first round of ideas out and then come back with something simpler. Okay, and they, they weld and they do all these kind of things. They really, you know, they use uh, uh, local everything that they can get, you know, to make things. And technology is not the main thing. Okay, very little bit of technology. Because once you know how to approach a problem and solve it, you know, technology is just a tool. That's, you know, you can't make it into your crutch, you know. So now, now the last phase is becoming an entrepreneur. So that is, at that point, you're looking at you know, how, what is the strategy, what's the risk that you have, and you know, how do you launch, and, and such. So uh, this is a uh, maker to entrepreneur boot camp, which is four, this is four weeks long that I ran last week, last, last time. I've run up to six week long programs. I'll talk about some of these. Primary talking about opportunity evaluation, you know, what kind of solution do you create, and how do you reach the customer? And you need to take it all the way to financial plan and such. So this is one project. Out of uh, last time uh, we took, this is interestingly my, uh, my ancestral home in, in my village. I converted that into a fab lab, you know, which is accredited fab lab from MIT. 
So, and uh, whenever I'm in travel through India, I put it up on Facebook, and few people come, and I say, the only thing is you had to stay with me. They, so we hire a cook, and we have 24-7 access to the lab, and they're making things, and then there's a whole, and at the end of it, they had to come back with a, a, a possible startup. Okay. And, and the one week long programs are shorter. This is a one month long program. And uh, this here they actually designed, uh, f went into the community, understood of interesting opportunity and created a company uh, uh, for making soaps. MIT Make in India program is a MIT program where we brought students from MIT and India together and we worked for four weeks. They visited a few different sites, and one of the sites that they visited was the group of women in this village who make uh, organic soaps in their, in their houses. They don't know exactly how to market it, how to sell it, how to make the company big. We came up with a thought, and why don't we give them uh, exposure to the market? Well, these women started making up soap like for their neighbors, for their relatives. They started discussing within the team, a whole team formed around this problem. They split up into uh, marketing team, business team, and product design team. We started learning about both, uh, the whole procedure, how to make a soap. <coughs> we took help from the women, they came, they taught us. We were able to make a complete 100% natural and 100% organic soap. Making this connection between two people, one who's making it and one who's using it, through this product, and create a story, create a conduit for somehow connecting these two people through the soap. That is how we came up with the soap called Kana. And uh, each soap comes with a little bit of a story about the person who made it. They started focusing on these hotel soaps. It is about 15 grams and it's, it's very small. The guests would see this not in a plastic bag, but every single part of the packing should say we are environmentally conscious. At the end of it, the idea was to empower these women to create these products and maybe find a market for these products in places they could never reach otherwise. We went and talked to the hotel people. We got a great response from them. We pitched our idea to them. There was like 20 or 30 hotel, uh, hotel managers and hotel owners. They were really interested. Now they're asking for the samples. So again, uh, at the end of it, they, they created a little uh, company which got the soap tested and you know and now they really want to create these uh, soaps that the women in these villages can make and they can sell it at a much higher price than what they were make, making before so that is the first step of an entrepreneur if you can actually put that bug in them and then once you can let them launch let the rest of the infrastructure that you know outside programs and outside entrepreneurship programs, then they can take them and run with them, you know, this uh, uh, f uh, incubation labs and such. So uh, make of primarily hacks things. They make things that are feasible that can be done. Uh, an innovative hacks a problem, you know, things that you, have, you want to make and something actually solves somebody problem, so, someone's problem, it is desirable. An entrepreneur, he hacks an opportunity and he makes it all the way till viable. And this is the you know, four stages that I take, take them through. And, and the training is uh, slightly different as we go through this. So actually, interestingly, the f these are, they're all system thinkers. You know, when you look at a maker, you know, he's looking at a product as a system, mechanical engineering, user interface, and, and things like that, like the useless box that you saw. He was not looking at sol solving anyone's problem. You know, uh, as an innovator, he needs to understand the problem system. You know, what causes it, who are all the stakeholders. You know, there is interest and influences, you know, because I, I don't know if you know about this wicked problem, the whole thing about the wicked problem. Wicked problem is where uh, people who can make a difference have no interest in making the difference, and people who want to make, see the difference have no power to make the difference, make the change. You know, so it just stays there, you know, co uh, corruption. It's one of those wicked problems. There are several such things. So. Uh, how do you understand and study the in interest and influence of all these uh, uh, stakeholders? And then taking it all the way to how do you uh, uh, look at it as a business system? So uh, 
the first program, this is as, as my part of my thesis, I took my, went and taught for six weeks. And all, my, all I asked the college was, give me 50 students. I don't care if they're from different uh, which year, which uh, discipline, which subject. But I want to make sure that at least 50% of them are girls. Because I find most of the girls kind of opt themselves out of these things. They say, no, they, we can't do it. And so I had to make sure that I had to reach them. So, uh, so this, uh, uh, I started with 50 <coughs> students. After six weeks, 30 of them started coming. This is in a college that had one student startup in the last 12 years. Okay. And uh, they formed an innovation center. They, and these are the companies that, these are real, right? out of which eight are still running in the, since uh, 2014. Some of them have gone out to do much you know, larger things. And this kid, this group created a f uh, pro something for uh, sleep apnea for neonates. You know, I don't know if you've heard of SIDS. Sudden infant death, death syndrome. That's because it's the same as sleep apnea. The, bar, or the the baby just stops breathing, and normally it's about 40, 50 minutes, 40, 50 seconds. You know, adult can survive, but the baby doesn't. So they put in oxy oximeters uh, in the little shoes, and uh, once the oxygen and uh, blood oxygen content reduces, it tickles the baby with little vibration motors and, and things like that. And then they have actually created a a company, primarily for neonates, because most of these, if you really <coughs> go into deep India, when neonates just go home with no protection. You know, after the baby is born, you know, you're given the baby and so go home. And they have, you know, 80% chance of uh, getting SIDS, you know, primarily with, you know, these kind of issues. So <coughs> question is, how do you make something which is cheap, which is, uh, that they can afford? And so this com the, these guys went and did that. So. I've been running these maker fests, uh, of, you know, all over Malaysia and and, and and places like this. I even taught in at IMD in Lausanne, uh, and also innovation programs all all over India. And uh, then I, I found, uh, f uh, you know, uh, of course, entrepreneurship programs are the f uh, three to six week long programs and full immersion. Okay. Uh, the Make in India, and I even did one for faculty. Because what I found in so many of these colleges, these kids go back to, go back to the college, and they realize that this, they cannot resonate with anyone. And these are like, you know, I have seen the world, you know, I have seen the light, I want to come back and do it. And they hit the wall. Because the faculty, there is no faculty who has actually ever started a company. Okay? And these are the people who are supposed to help them. Okay? And they're, uh, how do you f make this disconnect? You know, how do you solve this disconnect? So I ran a program for fa uh, mentors, uh, for, uh, for faculty in India. So uh, this is a, f uh, since we, the, the topic was about uh, Maker Lab to entrepreneurs, this is a program that uh, ASB and World Bank is working with right now to create a building, uh, such an ecosystem in Malaysia. and. Starting with, you know, how do you target university students and create a core team uh, of students as well as trainers, and then help them build their, their own ecosystem and give them an innovation lab, you know, make a lab, and slowly start, uh, let them do things and go back and mentor them, and then use the existing infrastructure. You know, I'm not interested in creating another, uh, 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 you know, accelerator or anything like that because they all exist you know it's just a matter of how do you feed into the existing system and the program primarily for, for your, it may be of interest to some of you so that's the reason I was showing this you know how do you take college students and start them through this and uh, we run maker innovation boot camps and train faculty and that can actually help this kind of flow build innovation center in a primarily of a maker lab uh, Entrepreneurship boot camp, and then ask outside agencies to come and take on the kids are com who are coming out. We, do, we don't want to have anything to do with that. You know, uh, and they are waiting for raw material to come in. Currently, they are, they lack raw material. They lack kids who who want to do these kind of things. So, I know for what, how much uh, we, 
how much time do we have? I just, I just finished closing up. So. Um, OK. So uh, how many of you have Maker Labs? Any of you, you have a Maker Lab? OK, good. There are a few of them. A uh, few of you. Uh, I, now the question is, how do you build these makers? So I came up with a couple of programs. I found that school to college, it really doesn't matter. You could actually, uh, people have asked me, when can someone be a maker? I believe when you can hold a crayon. OK, so you know, I, I th it, it is up from there. You know, for, and uh, f you could start at school level and college level. And uh, f I ha had this theory of art and craft of making. The craft of making, if I want to be a painter, I need to learn the craft of painting. I need to know the brush movements and color and all these kind of things at 10,000 times before I can paint a picture with the emotion. You know, I need to learn the craft. Okay? Similarly, if you want to make something, that is, when you, you don't learn to make when you have to make. You, know, you learn to make before. You don't learn to play the violin when I have to give a concert. Okay? You, you've learned and practice well before that. Uh, today, interesting thing is that with digital fabrication, you can actually s kind of sidestep the whole craft part. Because previously, if I had to make something out of wood, I need to learn woodworking. Okay. Today, I can design it on, on CAD, put a block of wood, and the ma machine will actually machine it for me. I don't need, need to learn how to do most of these things. Okay. So I can straight away go into the art of doing it, with a, but still with a little bit of exposure to the craft. So uh, Maker Lab can actually really help them. And first thing is, our job, my job, I feel, is to make them lose the fear. I just hold their hand and walk them through the first step. And say, see, you could do it. And then they have to fly. They have to take off after that. It is always the first step, which is the hardest for us. You know, If you say, can you uh, climb Mount Everest? You know, well, I'll say no, and then I'll sit back. But if I can make them climb smaller mountains, you know, they hopefully they they build the confidence. You know, can we run local maker programs which attract uh, makers as well as people who have been attracted to them and they can expose these kind of kids? Uh, this in, in India, we are doing something called the Maker Fest, a uh, Repair Fest. Repair Fest is on a Sunday afternoon. The community say, okay, anyone bring anything you want <laughs> with the kids. And learn to open it up. And you, know, you have no guarantee of going back with a working unit. Okay. <laughs> but the kid gets to open it up and mess it up. Okay. And you know, anyway, that thing is gone. You know, so how do you get them to train uh, these? And that actually slowly exposes them to, to the act of, act of making and opening up these kind of things. And uh, this is uh, started in a college. Uh, I, the idea was to start on a Friday afternoon, kids get together and say, uh, given a theme, uh, they, they have the whole week to ideate and create something. And the next Friday, they demonstrate it to the whole college. So and they have lunch in the lunch room and things like that. So not only do they expose what they can do, others get inspired by what these kids do. And hopefully, that can build a community. You know. and Thing is, how do we f inspire makers, make them into innovators, and hopefully incubate them into entrepreneurs? I, I believe in incubating entrepreneurs rather than companies. Thank you. Any questions? No. <laughs> Yes. So one page summary that's on the Dropbox. So I did. I just sent.